to our current executive director, Kevin et al., and many others whose personal and professional lives have intersected with the flags and the field of LGBTQ studies in some way or another. Um, a lot of people have shared um, uh, a lot of the history. I, I myself was, uh, felt uh, privileged to, to hear a lot of the history of CLAGS and the importance that CLAGS has played in uh, the, the, the maintenance and, and the direction that queer studies and LGBTQ studies has taken over time. And we've also heard a lot about the present, uh, a lot of present issues. So now we're going to focus ourselves as the last panel um, on the future. Um, but as we do so, I think it would be nice for our, 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 our uh, panelists to contextualize themselves within um, their positioning in CLAGS. And our panelists are starting, I believe, on your right, if my directions are correct, are um, Jesse Daniels, who is currently a professor of sociology um, at Hunter College and also here at the Graduate Center. Uh, Jesse is actually a current CLAGS board member. Then we also have uh, Darnell Moore, who is the editor of Mike News and the Feminist Wire, and is a former Flags board member, and I believe actually just flew in maybe within the last few hours, so we're happy that he's been able to, to join us today. And then we have uh, Yana Kalu, who is currently a, ma a master's student um, in Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies here at the Graduate Center, and is currently a Clags event, uh, a, the Clags Events and Program Director. And, I also um, uh, just want to praise Yana for uh, all the amazing work that Yana does for, for CLAGS. Um, a lot of it, I believe, out of the bounds of the paid position <laughs> that Yana occupies. So um, a lot of our, again, this is part of the plug for people to kind of give back to CLAGS because we operate on a shoestring budget. Many of the hours are, are volunteer, probably more than not. And then finally we have um, Matt Brim, who's an associate professor of queer studies at the College of Staten Island, and also here at the Graduate Center, and as a former CLAGS board chair. So just to reiterate, if um, we could just contextualize um, and situate yourselves within CLAGS and maybe just share an experience or two that has been rather salient on your personal professional life um, that intersects with your experiences in CLAGS. Anybody can start. <laughs> So I um, first came to New York City, I moved here in, I believe it was uh, 1995, um, uh, to start my first tenure track job at Hofstra University, where one of our board members is Maryland. And for me, I remember getting those early emails from CLAGS and getting these notices, um, and, and it was such a, CLAGS for me was always such a beacon of uh, queerness in the city and of queer studies. And I you know, probably attended one-tenth of the events that CLAGS put out, but, but for me it was some, somehow reassuring to know that there was this kind of uh, light on a hill that was CLAGS, and that, so that was sort of my relationship to it for lo these uh, uh, 20, 25 years. Um, and it was just within the last um, year or so that um, Kevin approached me about possibly being on the board after Kathy Cohen spoke at the Kessler Awards, and I was so moved by that that I went back and listened to the live stream of her talk and typed out a transcript of the talk because I just had to uh, repost that and share that around on social media because it was so meaningful to me. And Kevin saw that and said, hey, why don't you come so forward and do other things like that? So that's my story about class. Um, I think my, my story is about the same. I uh, was a student in a seminary, Princeton Seminary, um, struggling to find uh, struggling to find theologians who were attempting to sort of articulate a queer theoretical perspective to understanding black religiosity, to understanding the black church. Um, and it was, I had to sort of find other means to do that. It was through those emails. Um, <laughs> while, while a lot of the talks and things that I attended had less to do with religiosity, um, it did expose me to a range of scholars and activists and scholar activists and cultural workers who I might not have otherwise been exposed to in a school that was, um, yeah, who just, who just really invisible, not muted the voices of a queer and trans folk. Um, good afternoon. Um, Say I came to CLAGS um, after I moved to New York City. I, I um, had been out of college for several years and had 
Um, I graduated, I went to undergrad in Utah, of all wild places to be like, um, a queer bi-national person. And, um, and was sort of like, you know, even, you know, found my little like niche within the University of Utah and was, you know, quickly like sort of radicalized around, um, you know, the ways in which um, marriage has been used like to like not the benefit of folks of color, of, of queer people, um, and um, super passionate and you know, being activist at this time. And then um, quickly, you know, was graduated and was like, kind of spit out into this world in which the only place to continue this work are were LGBT nonprofits in which immediately all of the jobs were fighting for marriage and it was just this really sort of like, um, you know, this is like this really big gap in between the ways that like that, that scholarship around this work, um, like the thought around, around um, queer issues and then actually the activism, which is obviously we all know that that is not the only sort of realm in which um, LGBT activism is living, um, but that's that was sort of this trajectory, and it felt um, like this really um, kind of almost like opposite sort of experience for me. And then um, leaving Utah, moving moving to New York, and finding a place that really um, was this marriage of you know being both critical of some of these things, and also um, also a place where scholarship and activism. Um, and art really meet in this way was really meaningful for me um, and helped me kind of like make sense about um, the kind of centralization of power in both activism and academia and how, how those kinds of experiences even get produced. So. Uh, hi everybody, uh, thanks David and thanks Kevin. I'm so happy to be here with everybody. Can I turn it on? Um, I was on the board from 2008 to 2014, and um, I just want to highlight a moment, well, it, it was about a year and a half, but it was a, a moment looking back. I was the organiz uh, chair for the organizing committee for the Homo Nationalism and Pinkwashing Conference, and um, uh, that was an amazing conference, and amazing not only because of the product um, that was, was created and the discussions that were enabled, and I think it's on the live stream. If you go to Clags, uh, you can still watch that conference. Um, but because it was very, very difficult, um, it was a, a time on the board uh, where, I mean, it wasn't the Republican Party in the debate last night. Don't get me wrong, but um, <laughs> but, but I, it was a moment that taught me a lot about how to how to learn and talk with each other. Um, I look back and I'm not always uh, super happy with how the, how the discussions fell out at the time. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of passion, um, but it, it, I think it was a professionalizing experience for me. And um, it is an example of when Clags is ahead of the curve, and when Clags is pushing. Um, it was a moment where BDS was not quite as um, common in, uh, in the vernacular as it is now, and um, I think that is of a piece with that movement, and so I'm very proud to have been a part of that. But uh, definitely a learning experience. Yeah. Thank you. As we think about, about the future of, of LGBTQ, uh, queer studies, trans studies, and also the future of flags and the directions that flags should go into, I'd like us to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the issues that, um, that are impacting um, communities that intersect within uh, LGBTQ studies and within the work of flags. And also think about maybe even your personal um, experiences or issues that are personal to you that probably drew you to the work that, that you're engaged in right now. So this is kind of a challenge, but I'd like you to um, talk a little bit about what you see as the most pressing issue that queer or trans or LGBTQ studies, however you kind of think about the field, um, how that these fields of studies can address or help to address this issue. Wow. <laughs> uh, so, maybe what I'll do is, uh, um, it's really hard to, to focus on like that issue, um, but, but maybe I can present a set of challenges. Um, so uh, st I'll begin with a story. Uh, when I was on the board, we were going over a list of nominees for the Kessler Award for 2013. And 
I recall a conversation um, where we were talking about people. Cheryl Clark's name came up. How many of you know Cheryl Clark? Good. Um, and around the, the board table, I recall some of our colleagues who had not heard of Cheryl Clark. And I was stunned. Stunned, here we are, Clags, and this is Cheryl Clark, whose name comes up, and some of the board members say, who is that? Um, that wasn't the part that really stunned me. What stunned me was um, the sort of assertion that we should have, we could have thought about a more well-known, generally well-known candidate. That was a problem to me, because um, I had a sort of set of questions about um, how does, how does one come to know <laughs> um, these folk within our histories and her stories who we uh, sort of centralize? Um, so I had some questions. Uh, you, you know, like, when I think about LGBT studies, when I think about um, the work of, of establishmentarian LGBT work, questions like who, which canon comes to mind? Um, whose genealogy? It was clear that we were sort of tra traversing a genealogy that was quite different, um, my colleagues and I, um, and as it relates to coming to an understanding of what one might call LGBT history, queer history. Um, because for me, Cheryl Clark seemed to be a principal architect of what I've come to know as LGBT history, but for someone else, she was not even on the, on the radar, so which genealogy? Um, what public? So when the question was asked, you know, would people know her? <laughs> I thought, well, which public are we referencing? Um, and what and whose histories and her stories? Now this to me seems less of a problem that Clags had to deal with, but it, it implicated really a problem of a field, um, to me, anyway. Um, it, which leads me to the challenges that I want to bring up, and which has less to do with the particular things I think we should be focusing on, and maybe some questions we can be asking. Uh, I think the challenge before us is the need to resist dominant hegemonic genealogies. Um, and that is, you know, I think there, there's the work of this book, Gay Latino Studies, a critical reader by Michael Garcia and um, Javier Martinez that really does a really good job in an introduction that argues that we need to re-examine our starting places when we are thinking about these histories and her stories. Um, that is, one can begin a type of uh, LGBT history that centers white, cisgender, heterosexual, uh, white, cis, um, gay men, <laughs> um, and maybe women sometime, uh, lesbian <coughs> women, or we can think about uh, other routes to the type of histories that we've arrived at today. I think the invisibilizing, not only of those bodies of those histories are just as problematic uh, as some of the problems I can link to politically. Second, a question I have or a challenge is this notion of canonization. And I wanna read quickly and um, uh, this quote from Marlon Riggs. This was from an interview in 1992 um, on rethinking canonization as a sort of hegemonic practice. Uh, he quote, he says, the moment we canonize ourselves and contain ourselves, whatever we are doing will lose its subversive impact because then we'll be in the process of simple consolidation, the way a lot of black cultural studies are these days. It's like we're simply looking for texts to affirm who we think we are rather than challenging the texts that are out there and challenging ourselves which I think is a level of subversion that always that we always have to maintain, not to reify ourselves. So I'm bothered by this search for a black gay aesthetic because no such thing will ever exist. We are much too pluralistic to have one aesthetic, end quote. I thought that was really interesting. A really interesting challenge to think about canonization as a hegemonic process, mm -hmm. as a violent one even. Um, and then last, um, I'm thinking about what it might mean to play the boundaries between these rigid spaces that we create between something like the academy and the street, um, such that we create experts um, and, and we talk about subjects or talk around them without ever talking to them. Um, and I want to list, lift up an example of what a sort of collaborative process of knowledge production can look like. In Newark, we created the Queer Newark, Queer Newark Oral History Project 
that did not look at the, the black and brown queer and trans people we were attempting to sort of record and archive as separate and apart from the process of knowledge production. We understood that they were experts too, such that there was, there was no need to sort of separate them or keep them out of the conversation. Um, those are challenges that I want to lift up, but I, I want to say that, you know, in a moment that we're in now, uh, this sort of moment where this notion of black lives mattering or, or the mattering of, of various lives, marginal lives, particularly the lives of those who exist on the edges of the margins are critical to us, that these type of questions within spaces like this are just as critical um, as our call to protest, as our call to policy work, um, and much else. So I think for me, um, you know, thinking about some of the, the challenges and sometimes the, the contradictions that we feel within our work in academic spaces or in activist spaces, um, it gets centralized around, um, around the issue of, of labor often with, within the organization for me. Um, I think after I decided I couldn't anymore more do um, marriage time, I, um, I moved over to the labor movement for the last three years before I joined CODS. Um, and, um, you know, I was working on, on organizing um, low wage workers in the retail sector, making sure folks had access to health insurance. Um, and then, um, and then all, you know, as we've kind of heard um, for, throughout the day, um, the need for, um, the need for funding so staff can have uh, health care, so staff can have um, hey, so staff can have, um, you know, so we're not, we're no, we're not just putting on, um, you know, programs, running programming on trans issues and on trans healthcare and on um, non-binary folks having access to hormones and um, and surgeries. But then when when that is when that also ends up happening internally because of the bureaucratic systems that we are working within, then there is like a even sort of like, you know, sort of met like, um, you know, a turning in that we really need to, to that we really need to look at. Um, and so um, there's, uh, you know, a part of this, of this role for me as, as putting on programming and events that feels like this really beautiful labor of creating the space and the administrative, like arts administration and, and um, activism and scholarship sort of like you know, um, making making these containers and making these connections, um, and um, but also and, and, you know, and and for me there is this also beautiful split of a uh, big part of my job is like you know what are the ideas, what are the issues, um, who are the folks like doing this work that that we really can showcase, and so I get to be in this like realm of ideas that feels really fruitful and really productive. And then there's the other part of it, it's like we need 40 chairs for this room, you know? So there is this like split of ideas and tasks that really does feel great, but what what feels sort of, um, what feels challenging, like when we're like, okay, we, we really should, um, as, as our founder said, have a, have a conference on, on queerness and, and poverty. Um, I think we also need to have a conference on queerness and poverty in flags, you know? Um, <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like a lot of folks historically in this room have been dealing with this as well. Um, and so um, I think for me that's, um, you know, this is sort of one of the big kind of social justice issues of our time that like within professionalized activism or professionalized scholarship that we um, are still, um, and it is, I don't think it's specific to LGBT, but it's specific to justice movements across the board that we're still not so great at um, figuring out how to, how to take care of these pieces and build what we, like, you know, build, build it in, in terms of. So, um, I think that I'm also very dead at her. So many times I really didn't know, it was such a treat for me to do this, and I, I feel, also really inspired by the amount of activism within academia that it even took, you know, it took to found the first women's studies programs um, in CUNY that took to found, found CLAGS here. And so I just think that this is the, this is also the call to like, um, to, to keep, keep doing that. Um. 
Um, so I have sort of one idea today, and um, it, it comes from thinking about what brings me to the stage. And um, there's a, a virtue of CLAGS that I think does not get talked about, and that is that CLAGS is a mechanism to give community college professors and professors at working class institutions of higher ed a voice and a shaping presence in LGBTQ studies. Yeah. Yeah. And this does not happen. Um, mm. Queer studies is rich queer studies. Queer wow. studies is written by people who went to elite institutions as undergrads, who went to elite institutions as grad students, who were mentored by top star professors, and who got contracts for books often before the book was written. <laughs> There's a pipeline, and higher ed is as hierarchical of an institution, a system, as you would ever want. And queer studies is within higher ed. Now, one thing queer studies has done to push back against that is to make connections, to build bridges to communities, right, outside of academia. I think CLAGS is amazing at that. I think we need to continue that. But I think that that kind of outreach has obscured another necessary kind of outreach, and that's outreach intra-academic outreach between institutions up here, right, of which there are, I don't know, how many CUNY schools would we say are top institutions? Zero? Like, I think we're in it. <laughs> this building right now is sort of the jewel. Um, we need to build bridges between the top institutions, I should just do quotes throughout, and uh, the bottom feeders, right, the tier four schools. The, my school, College of Staten Island, 74% of our incoming students uh, come in as associate degree students. Uh, we admit 100% of our applicants. Much of CUNY is community college professors. And even if you're at a senior college, right, not a junior college, um, you're still teaching 21 hours a year, just like everybody else is. And you're still teaching working class students. And so you're still doing working class queer, queer pedagogy. And, um, Queer pedagogy, queer studies happens everywhere. It's always surprising to me how you look at these community colleges all around the country, these working class colleges all around the country, and queer studies is happening there. And queer studies professors there, often not called queer studies professors, know queer studies, they know queer theory, they've read the same thing everybody else has and they can teach it just as well. In other words, information is coming from the top down, everybody knows it, and that's defining the field. Well, it's coming bottom up. There's no good way right now for information, for the queer pedagogies, for the queer theories that happen when you teach students who work 30 hours a week. There's no good way for that information, for that queer theory to move up. And part of that is because try to get a publishing contract if you teach at a community college with a top press. Um, it is not coincidence that, so I published a book. Clags did not help me publish that book, but in my heart, I think, I would not have been able to publish that book with the top academic press had I not been a member of CLAGS, had CLAG not been in my life. Mm -hmm. Because it gave me a way to interface with people who were doing that kind of work. It gave me some kind of wherewithal to know what publishing a book meant, right? Even though I teach at CSI, right, an, an outer borough school. Um, and so I was very fortunate, and CLAGS really brought me into that conversation and nurtured me in that way. But look at uh, my press, which is University of Michigan Press, the two people who have published in queer studies who teach at working class schools or community college schools, both have been associated with CLAGS. Mm -hmm. Jim Wilson, who is ED, he teaches at LaGuardia, and me. Look at top queer studies presses, Duke, NYU. Look who publishes with them. Look what schools they're at. Look where they went to school. It's the pipeline. Now, that's brilliant queer theory. <laughs> it's brilliant. I'm so glad we have it. I'm so thankful. I think it's fascinating. We need that. I don't want that to change. Right? That has been sustaining for us in so many ways. But we need to round out what it means to have queer theory. And queer theory, you know, theory broadly defined. We need to round out what it means to inform the field of queer studies. And that means we need some way of moving information, pedagogies, theories, from working class institutions up. Um, I don't know how that happens, but I do know that CLAGS makes that happen. And one reason that it can is because we're in this system, right? 
And so we are all able, we're, not, we're separate, but we're within a couple miles of each other. And we have class centering us here. And so we can come together here as working class queer studies professors and CLAGS enables us to do that work. But that doesn't happen in very many places. I went to grad school at Indiana University, and they have branch campuses all over the state. It's impossible for people to come together who are teaching at those community colleges and branch campuses in the same way that CLAGS enables us to do that here. So I think that we need to figure out a way to tell the world that story, and CLAGS needs to be a leader in figuring out how to move queer studies from the bottom up. on um, understanding the future of um, LGBTQ and queer studies is a little different um, and comes slightly from outside of CLAGS. Um, my lens is always through the, the lives and experiences of LGBTQ homeless youth that I've uh, worked with and they're, um, and so I'm going to talk just a little bit about some stories uh, through and from them and, and sort of how I see that as connected to the, the future of, um, of what we do at CLAGS. Um, so one of the first things that I noticed when I started hanging out with um, some LGBTQ youth, uh, youth in my um, world uh, was their facility and, and great skill with digital technologies. And this was in 2006, long before um, most of us had smartphones, before I did. Um, and what I learned from them is that digital technologies are not, um, not only for recreation, although that's part of it, but they're crucial for their survival on the street. So while we may think about Grindr as sort of the go-to app for uh, queer digital life, for um, many of these young people living on the streets of New York, digital technologies are how they connect to each other, and it's how they access um, the legitimate economy as well as engage in sex work for survival. Um, and digital technologies are, as I heard one young person tell me, how we stay sane. Um, so it's a crucial connection um, for them. And I think that for us in um, queer um, theory or LGBTQ studies, however you want to say it, um, there's not been enough of theorizing about the digital. We simply don't understand yet how the digital is transforming queer identity and the formation of queer community. Um, and so that's, I think, an important um, area for future investigation. Echoing what Darnell and uh, other folks here have said, one of the other um, uh, things that I learned from uh, LGBTQ homeless youth is that they're majority black and Latino. Um, and what that means to me is that we have to rethink the whiteness of queer theory. Uh. And here I'm just going to um, quote uh, Hiram Perez, who says, uh, queer theorizing, as it has been institutionalized, is proper to and property to white bodies. Um, so I think that one of the places that we have to interrogate um, mm. the work that we're doing is to think about how what we know about being queer is premised on white bodies, on the experience of white people, and, and question our epistemologies of queer theory. Like, are there ways in which the very questions that we're asking are premised on white experience? So I think that's a, a second place. Um, that queer theory needs to go. Um, Perez goes on and says that um, oftentimes this, um, when you bring up the issue of race in, uh, in queer theory circles, that, that the charge against people that do this is that they're um, hijacking this conversation. And, and Perez goes on to say how perfectly the phrase hijacked by identity politics condenses the political dynamic, dynamics of establishmentarian queer theory. In the era of the war on terrorism and the USA Patriot Act, the word hijacked invokes rhetoric of national belonging and not belonging, the restriction of brown bodies from queer theory's institutional spaces shares ideological underpinnings with the expulsion of brown bodies from the nation state. Of course, Kevin et al.'s wonderful work with CLAGS and his efforts to open up this space to queer scholars of, of color with the conference by that same name has certainly been a step and an important one in this regard, but there's much more work that needs to be done here, and it's work that needs to be done at the level of epistemology. Um, by asking such questions as uh, what we say, uh, how is what we say we know about being queer shaped by whiteness? 
Um, it's often, for the most part, queer scholars of color who are asking and answering this question, and more space needs to be created for this, along with white scholars of, uh, who are queer, who are investigating our own subject positions as well. Um, two other quick things I learned from uh, LGBTQ homeless youth um, and from Kathy Cohen, um, which is that we, that our understanding of queer theory and queer politics has to move us toward a path toward liberation um, and one that is joined with anti-racist politics. There's, there's no future for queer theory if it's not um, foundationally uh, joined with anti-racist politics. And I, I will just point you to Kathy Cohen's remarks about uh, when she won the Kessler Award for, for more about that. I mean, part of, part of what Cohen said was that um, we're living in a time of multicultural neoliberalism. And she um, made the remark that the, um, that the killing of Michael Brown really had more to do, was more in line with uh, the murders of Sakia Gunn and, um, I have to look at my notes, and Cece McDonald, the arrest of um, Cece McDonald, um, because the words that she said were that because uh, as young folks of color operate in the world as queer subjects. So I think that part of what we have to do going forward is find, find the way that um, uh, queer theory uh, can join with um, black liberation and anti-racist politics. And the, the final thing that I wanted to say that I learned from um, the, the young people who, are, who identify as LGBTQ and are, and are uh, unstably housed, they actually don't call themselves homeless most of the time. They would just say, I'm not, uh, I don't have a regular place to live right now. Um, the, the shelter where I encounter most of these young people is, um, is called Sylvia's Place, and it was actually started um, as, a, as the fulfillment of a deathbed bed wish by Sylvia Rivera, a Latina transgender activist, who at the end of her life uh, became involved in Metropolitan Community Church of New York, and on her deathbed uh, made Reverend uh, Pat Baumgartner, who leads that congregation, uh, promise that she would establish a homeless shelter for, uh, for queer homeless youth. Um, and part of what I think Sylvia Rivera's um, uh, ask, if you will, um, uh, to establish that shelter was recognizing the both spiritual and material damage um, that we encounter as queer people in this society. And so I, I think, and the shelter is really a response to both the material damage as well as the spiritual damage. There's a wonderful um, book by Patricia Williams called The Alchemy of Race and Rights, where she introduces this concept of spirit murder. And I think that there's, I think that there's a way in which um, the LGBTQ homeless youth that I, uh, that I know, as well as all of us as queer people, encounter a kind of spirit murder from religious traditions, from our families, from the world at large. Even at this moment where we are living through this sort of assimilationist time period, we still encounter this kind of uh, spiritual uh, spirit murder, and I think that the future of queer studies is going to have to find ways to rethink LGBTQ identity and community in ways that include queer spirituality. We're split at the root if we don't um, embrace the erotic and the spiritual at the same time, and there's a long tradition that does that, going back to Audre Lorde and um, Carter Hayward and, and um, through today to people like Roger Greer, um, who are people who are trying to think about the spiritual and the erotic, erotic together, but we don't do that much in queer theory. So that, <clears throat> that would be my sort of direction that I would point us in. Woo. Well, I don't know about all of you, but I'm sitting here kind of blown away and trying to just take in everything I'm, I'm hearing. Um, as we think about the future, so many issues and areas uh, our four panelists have addressed, including you know, revealing these purposefully hidden and silenced histories right, that have been left out of, out of, uh, out of, uh, out of knowledge, right, out of the knowledge base. Um, uh, needing to blur the boundaries between uh, the academy and the streets so that what uh, LGBTQ studies is producing is actually making a difference, but also uh, what we're attempting to do is going to be relevant to begin with. Thinking about these labor-related issues, economic justice, um, building this internal infrastructure that is often missing from from um, from uh, from organizations that uh, intend to do well. Um, thinking about CLAGS as this mechanism that gives community college and working class 
um, scholars, really, um, the voice that, that they need, um, and thinking about um, um, what Clegg's can do for that, and how that's missing from queer studies, thinking about uh, the voices that are often neglected, the marginalized, the, the margins of the margins, if you will, these LGBTQ youth, uh, homeless youth, rather, um, that we can learn a lot from, thinking about uh, utilizing digital technologies um, to uh, influence um, uh, queer theories and what have you, um, and the spiritual murder, right, that is uh, going on day in, day out, right, um, that we've all um, experienced and may have learned lent a hand in uh, creating in one way or another, acknowledging both sides of that. So as we think about all these issues, we don't have much time, but I want to give you another challenge, you know, uh, as Clyde's crosses its 25th uh, year in existence, it's really important that we honor and recognize all that Clyde's has done to influence um, LGBTQ studies. On the same hand, it's also necessary for Clyde's to continue to grow and evolve to ensure that our work is relevant. Right. So I want to kind of ask you all, we can be brief because I want to open it up for discussion. You know, we, there are a couple current, well, one current board member, but an a, a integral staff member on the panel. We also have a number of board members um, in the audience. Uh, we also have some future board members in the audience <laughs> as well. And we want to really take what we've learned today to kind of help Clyde's grow and evolve. So what is one challenge that you can give to Clyde's to help ensure that the future work of Clyde's for the next 25 years is relevant to LGBTQ studies. One challenge. <laughs> or a set of small challenges. This is hard. Um, someone said earlier that the arguments are still there, here. And I kept thinking, that's because the problems are still here. Um, and in terms of, of responding to some of the, the problems of um, how does one choose which fight, which battles to fight, um, I mean, I think we need to answer that question. <laughs> um, we should be fight, fighting for all of them, particularly if I understand queer and queerness as a radical politic of destabilization of power, state-sanctioned violence, state power, um, that to me means any type of technology, any type of, of weaponry, any type of, of, of institutional systemic process that are, that's working against the livelihood, the well-being, the subject, the, 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 just the lives of people um, we should be responding to. Now, that's a tricky question when you, when you have limited resources, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, if queerness is more interested in theory than materiality, then we lose the fight. And this is not a new argument. Um, I'm only reiterating what so many, uh, so many scholars and scholar activists have said before. That is, you know, I think about the term black lives matter. Matter. Matter and not only in terms of, uh, you know, a call for us to be concerned about black lives, black bodies, black personhood, but it's centralizing the body that's centralizing matter. In other words, I should be thinking beyond just the, the sort of theoretical aspects of queerness, the shit that's safe that we can talk about in here. I want to think about the lives of sex workers on the street. I want to think about the lives of our kids who are living on the street with houseless as we come to conferences like this and can eat well and can talk these conversations when in fact so many of our people um, are being slaughtered by the things we're theorizing. So I want to think, uh, maybe my challenge is, how can we position ourselves to respond to the material consequences of the very things we're theorizing? Let's have another challenge. issues that Yana was saying uh, earlier, and, and it also raises issues, issues of hierarchy 
that Matt was raising about um, institutions, but I think that there's a there's a real opportunity that CLAGS has going forward to make as much of the scholarship that the people associated with it um, have created, making that openly accessible in whatever form so that, so that anyone, whether they're accessing the internet um, at the Apple store, which a lot of the um, unstably housed folks that I know uh, do, or from their phones, so that they can access that material from anywhere. So I mean, I think it sounds like a tiny thing, but I think it actually has the potential to, to be transformative in different ways. And I also think that it means it, it makes us be more self-reflexive about the kind of research that we're putting out in the world, right? If you, if you know that the whole world is going to be reading it, it really sort of makes you check and say, well, oh, look, who are the voices that are always here? Thank you. Free books for all CUNY students. <laughs> Thanks for making it happen. We don't have to have free college. We are not going to have free college. Um, not next year, not the year after that. We can do free books. Let's do free books. Um, it's not just about fundraising, it's about changing what, how we think about publishing and responsibilities that publishers have. And um, uh, this goes hand in hand with technology. Okay? So if we can get technologies into hands, we can get books into hands. Thank you. Um. You know, I think I think for me, we are we are always sort of faced with you know identifying identifying challenges, and then the next like sort of like solution oriented place that we go next is well, you know, we need we need funding for for X Y Z, and I, I I think I also really want to resist this like throwing throwing money at the problem as like the only um, as as like that's not what like transformational justice means, I think, in, in any way. Um, but but I think um, it's, it's about like throwing our, our bodies in, and, and if we are going to really kind of take take the praxis seriously, um, that that we've all been um, speaking so you know, passionately about, that it's it really is about um, it really is about a commitment to um, our community, which I think we all already have. Um, I feel like we have the hearts to do it and the minds to do it. Um, and, uh, and I think for me it's it's really building that starting starting really small and building that building that internally and being um, I think we've already been a model for for what um, an organization and a public institution can be um, can be this bridge between activism between academia can be um, between us, I think that the we haven't talked so much today about the fellowship, the grants that we um, that we make some, but um, you know we're already we're already doing this work, um, and I think doing it um, doing it in a way that we give that we give what we what we have, um, and we we are really clear about um, we're really clear about the small. Um, but the smallest, the smallest pieces really are the biggest. I think that when we are talking about homeless youth, we're talking about it's the it's the cell phone, um, it's it's the little rays um, that that really makes makes a big difference. Thank you. Now well, we have a few minutes for questions. Has a question. First of all, thank you so much for um, each individual challenge. My question has to do with how do you deal with false history that is created to satisfy the reflection of diversity within who we were historically and who we are today? All right, who'd like to tackle that question? Very important false histories. Well, I mean, I, I don't have an answer, but I, mean, I think it's a I think it's a deep question. I've written some about um, the civil rights era and um, and how young people find histories of Martin Luther King online. And in fact, there are people who 
with nefarious intent who are trying to um, create a false history about Martin Luther King and his legacy. Um, and for me, the, the part of the answer is that this um, struggle about what is the narrative that gets told about history is happening online. And it's happening in really um, uh, challenging ways. So for example, the website martinlutherking.org is a URL that's owned and controlled by white supremacists. <laughs> and, and most, and I interviewed young people 15 to 19, asked them what do they think about this, and most of them read that URL as, as lending legitimacy to the site because it ends in .org. Now I did that research, finished in 2008, I just talked 